Well, good afternoon or good morning, depending where in the world you are, and um, warm welcomes to our Students as Change Agents final presentation, um, part one, for the Edinburgh Tourism Action Groups Challenge, which large numbers of you, as in 10 groups of students, have been working feverishly on for the last four weeks. So we're really excited to, to see so many of you and looking forward to seeing your videos, seeing your faces and hearing more about your experience and also um, giving each other a chance to ask questions and see where, th where these ideas can go. So before we start, um, I'm Ruth Donnelly, Assistant Director at the Careers Service. Um, I've electronically met most of you, I think, so far. Um, and I will turn my video off after I speak to improve the, the connection for people. But I just wanted to say some thanks before we start, um, particularly to our hosts um, at eTag. We have really appreciated having this challenge to work on. Um, we're all at least temporary as a residents of Edinburgh and really care about the city and it, its tourism and, and festivals and the, the number of students who've signed up for this challenge is evidence of the fact that students want to see a change here and, and see what we contrib can contribute to making that change um, post-COVID. So thank you um, Kim and others from eTag. Uh, thank you too for the coaches, many of whom are involved this afternoon and cheering on your groups. We really appreciate the, the fact that you've volunteered your time to, to work with the groups and make sure that they've been able to keep on track and, and come up with the amazing ideas we're going to hear about shortly. Thanks too to our trainers. We have colleagues from Edinburgh Futures Institute, Edinburgh Innovations and um, the, Scot the Social Enterprise Academy as well as two students who have been working as data coaches for us um, to help student groups make, the, make sense of the data and develop their skills and confidence in, in using data. So the fact that you have thrown yourselves into this, I think will become evident as we start to, to hear you speak and, and to see the videos. But I just want to really encourage you to, to keep that momentum going and use the your desire to see change become change agents to not just have created an amazing resource and stimulated thought for eTag but to, to use that further afield and, and to keep on influencing some of you will have come up with ideas which could potentially become businesses social enterprises and we would strongly encourage you to harness the energy that you've developed over the course of working on this challenge to use that um, to keep going and really make a difference. So thank you all for, for what you've contributed so far and I'll pass over to Al now who's going to take over the next part of the session. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much Ruth. Um, just to um, highlight to everyone that this session is being recorded for purposes of promotion and evaluation. If you would rather not be recorded, then please keep your microphone muted and your camera off throughout. I should also say the details of the chat shall also be recorded. So today uh, we're using Collaborate as the platform to present um, uh, and have our conversation. Collaborate is best enjoyed using Chrome. So if you haven't opened Collaborate this session, through a Chrome window, I suggest you log out and log back in on a Chrome window. If you are having a poor experience, Chrome will, sorry, Collaborate will tell you if you're having a poor experience, and of course you will know, uh, please try logging out and back in again. Um, you could also try placing your computer closer to your router, and if possible, turn off additional devices that may also be using the internet. This afternoon, as ever, with, um, uh, with running things virtually, um, there are bound to be one or two technical difficulties, but um, I'm sure we'll all be able to work around them. So thanks for joining us and thanks for clicking in today. My name is Al, I'm the project manager of Students as Change Agents, as Ruth has said. In a moment, I'll hand over to the teams for the introductions and before they screen their videos. First, I'm gonna go through a few notes about the programme. 
Um, so this is only the fourth version of Change Agents that we've delivered, and it's obviously landed at an incredible time. I'm eternally grateful to all colleagues and partners that have helped make it, um, uh, uh, help deliver it, as well as to our participants who have put so much hard work in. I would particularly like to celebrate Kat, Vera, and Nathaniel for creating the data and design tools and exploring ideas, content training, Bobby Pembleton from Edinburgh Innovations for his pitching session, and Elsa and Lucy from the Social Enterprise Academy Scotland for helping change agents better understand teams and storytelling. Thanks also to Lauren and Christina, the change agent interns, and of course, Ruth Donnelly as program director. A massive and heartfelt thanks also to the coaches. Back in January, when I suggested that we run a program in June between exams and graduation, we were thinking maybe we would have around 40 students and six groups. So to finish with over 150 students and 20 groups is just fantastic, but just could not have been achieved without colleagues volunteering their time. I have a feeling that Ruth and I may well be paying back favors for quite a while to come. In all seriousness, thank you so much to the coaches because in moving online, we were particularly concerned about the lack of interaction and support that we would be able to offer groups. You have absolutely enabled this to happen. Thanks also to DDI for funding the program. Having spoken to many groups and seen the energy that has been put into the program, it definitely feels like something highly valued by participants, and I hope that it opens up opportunities for more innovative data practice and activities with students in the future. Thanks as well to Kim from Edinburgh Tourism Action, Action, Tourism Action Group for helping work with me and Josh uh, from DDI in setting this huge challenge question which has grabbed the imagination of so many of our change agents. We're also joined by James McVeigh by Festivals Edinburgh who helped develop deliver the host presentation. And they've both been on hand to answer questions from challenge groups. Without our partners, we are unable to host real world challenges. So your support, your support is incredibly valuable. And finally, a massive thank you to all of our incredible change agents, all of you that have joined this program and embraced this very new manner of delivery. We are delighted that so many of you have been able to take part. Um, and just as a snapshot, just to give you an idea, we have students on this program from every level of study at the university. We have had um, 157 different nationalities take part in Change Agents Online, representing students from over 20 different university schools or deaneries. Um, and you've all joined from a whole heap of different time zones. So as Ruth said, good afternoon from Edinburgh, uh, but good morning or indeed good evening, depending on where you are. So to today, and today's format will follow this kind of um, outline. Um, a group will introduce themselves um, and then I will screen the video. So if there are any technical hiccups, everyone can just blame me. Then there will be some space at the end of the um, after we've watched the video for some questions. So please either raise your hand using the icon that you have. Um, uh, if you hold your mouse over the, your screen, you should get next to your microphone, your camera, then you've got a, a little icon with a raised hand. So you can raise your hand to ask your question or put it into the chat box. To open the chat box, click on the purple arrows to the right of the screen, and that will be able to, um, you'll be able to see the chat that's going on there. If you're asking a question, um, uh, we would ask that once you've um, put your hand up and um, someone from the groups has asked you to start talking, doing your question, um, please have your camera on if at all possible. Um, that's if your bandwidth allows it. Um, if you aren't talking at any time, please remain muted. And hopefully everything will be absolutely super seamless. I'll be keeping an eye on the time, so we'll move things on as and when needed. Um, and where possible, we'll make all the videos and indeed this recording available on the Students as Change Agents YouTube channel. So moving forward to today's running order and where we can have the conversations as well. So we've got five groups today, all sustainable tourism groups. We have group six, followed by group seven, then eight, 10 and nine. You have received the written report via your Outlook invitation or you have access to it if you're part of the program in, your, in, the major, in the main MS team. So that's uh, general, files, and then written outputs. This isn't the only space that conversation can be had today. Um, so please, if you are engaging us um, um, on social media, then our Twitter handle is UOE underscore um, S-A-C-H-A, Sasha, and Instagram students underscore as underscore change underscore agents. And on either of those channels, then please use Ed Change Agents. And that goes again for um, social media on LinkedIn. So 
Um, please follow us and, and join us on LinkedIn to continue the conversations. That's uh, linkedin.com forward slash school forward slash students as change agents with hyphens in between. So in a moment, I will just prepare to hand over to uh, group six, who will be ready to um, start presenting and introducing themselves to you as the audience. So if someone from group six can um, uh, take over, that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for the introduction, Al. Um, we are group six and my name is Daniela. I'm going into my fourth year of a cognitive science undergraduate degree. Uh, hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a postgraduate student at the MSc Global Crime, Justice and Security Program. Hi, my name is Elizabeth. Sorry, my computer is not letting me share my video, but I am going into my fourth year of sustainable development. I'm Jonathan. I'm a law student going into my third year. Uh, unfortunately, I can't seem to share my video either. Hi, I'm Nisha. I'm a postgrad environmental sustainability student, and also my screen doesn't seem to allow me to share today, but I'll try again later. Um, firstly, as a team, we wanted to thank both ETAG and the Students Exchange Agent Programme for allowing us the opportunity to work on such an interesting, complex, and vital challenge. And we would additionally like to thank Al and our coach Rosalind for guiding us throughout this project. Narrowing down the focus of our project is quite difficult. In brainstorming, we identified several key areas for sustainable improvement within Edinburgh's tourism industry that we would have liked to explore, but eventually we decided upon the key issue of domestic tourist transport into the city of Edinburgh, believing it would let us leave the biggest positive effect. During our research process, we discovered that transport accounts for approximately three quarters of global tourism emissions. In other words, how tourists travel to and from tourist destinations like Edinburgh has a far greater environmental impact than what they do when they actually get there. We believe COVID-19 provides the perfect time to incite a, incite a change in tourist travel behavior, since people are considerably more averse to international and plane travel. Destinations are increasingly reliant on their domestic markets. Um, in terms of challenges, we found some difficulties in working in teams through an online medium. This was, for the most of us, uh, the first time that we worked collaboratively in this way. It was also a new challenge for us to create a good quality video on three platforms like Adobe Spark or Clipchamp, but nonetheless, we managed to pull through and develop key skills that we can take with us into academia and our future careers. And so without further ado, we'll show you our video. We hope you enjoy it and look forward to any feedback or questions that you have. Edinburgh thrives on its tourism industry. In 2015, Edinburgh recorded 3.85 million visitors. This amounted to 1.3 billion pounds worth of services sold to visitors and 400 million pounds paid in wages and salaries in 2015. In 2019, four in five overnight visitors to Scotland were from within the UK. Domestic overnight visitors who came to Edinburgh for a holiday rose from 1.24 million in 2018 to 1.52 million in the next year. They accounted for an average of £435 million in spending each year. Problematically, many choose unsustainable travel options. In 2019, 3.37 million passengers flew between Edinburgh and London. In the same year, over 5 million flew between Edinburgh and other UK airports. In 2018, only 10.2% of visitors from outside Scotland travelled by rail. Flying creates much more carbon emissions than rail and coaches combined. However, COVID has changed attitudes to travel. A recent survey in June suggests that 4 in 10 Scottish adults did not want to fly for the foreseeable future due to COVID concerns. A further 27% said they will avoid flying unless no alternatives are available. So how can we turn this threat into an opportunity? We envision a scheme where domestic tourists would be incentivized to travel sustainably. This scheme would be composed of two parts. 
part of a reward scheme, train and bus tickets to Edinburgh and ferry tickets to Scotland would generate points on an app. These points would be exchangeable for discounts at affiliated businesses of the scheme. But why would this work? Well, that's because it has worked before. The Better Points app was created to lower car emissions under the Bellamosa scheme in Italy 2017 by incentivizing healthy alternatives. As part of the scheme, points could be used to get discounts or rewards in businesses around the city. Over its first 12 months, the scheme partnered with over 100 local businesses, gained 22,000 users, and prevented 1.4 million kilograms of CO2 emissions. Our proposal would be a natural evolution of Better Points, focusing on long distance travel to Edinburgh festivals, while also actively promoting the scheme and sustainable travel in order to maximise its positive effects. Awareness would be raised using social media, traditional advertising and signs, and in conjunction with its partners. The app itself will inform consumers on the importance of sustainable choices through its use, allowing them to make informed and hopefully more environmentally sustainable choices in other purchases. Consumers want to make sustainable choices. According to recent statistics, 72% of travellers believe people need to start making sustainable travel choices now, and 46% travel more sustainably if presented with economic incentives to do so. They just need a push in the right direction. Alongside promoting sustainability, the scheme will bring numerous benefits to affiliated businesses through bringing businesses together by working under a common scheme towards a common goal, offering smaller businesses equal opportunity to contribute and benefit as part of the scheme, attracting new customers through discounts and exposure to affiliates, and bringing new appeal to their public image. As the greenest city in the UK, Edinburgh is the prime candidate to take these next steps. Let's put Edinburgh back on track. Thank you so much, Al, for playing our video, and thank you to everyone for watching. Um, does anyone have any questions for us they'd like to ask? Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, I'll read it out if that's OK. Um, excellent approach to this challenge and very well presented. Congratulations. Thank you on behalf of Team Six. Did you consider any way to encourage rail companies to play their part to make this an economic alternative for UK tourists? Would anyone on our team like to come forward with an answer? Or would anyone like to? answer Ruth's question? If not, I can jump in. No, okay, I'll jump in if that's okay. Um, so Ruth, uh, we did consider, in fact, uh, so you said, do you consider any way to encourage rail companies to play their part to make this an economic alternative for UK tourists? Well, we did actually believe that it was in, within their interest to uh, encourage domestic train travel. Um, particular specific, uh, in terms of specifics, I suppose we haven't thought that far, but we also we thought, um, in fact, that perhaps it could be, as I said, a, a means of encouraging domestic train travel, which is within, um, you know, rail companies' uh, interests. And then that, in fact, because there are electric trains um, that uh, will be uh, that will be introduced in a, a couple of years, uh, that that would make train travel even more sustainable. Um, as I say, we just thought that it would be within their interests. But in terms of encouraging them to play their part, um, I th we thought that was perhaps maybe within uh, that might be more within the remit of ETAG to think about the specifics. But we just thought in general that it was within their interest to encourage domestic train travel. It was kind of a win-win um, opportunity for them as well. I think Dan is, is jumping in there possibly. Yeah, that's OK. Um, we were also considering what it means for a transitional period during co this COVID era, kind of the Hitachi Rail is restarting their manufacturing for these electric trains this year and they're planning to roll it out in autumn 2021 if I'm not wrong and 
we were wondering what the impact of this might be, and we thought there are actually short-term benefits for turning sustainable, um, turning to sustainable options because it will help restart the manufacturing industry, uh, bring more investment into these alternative um, solutions as well. I think, yeah, just to carry on from what Dan and Nisha were saying, um, I think for the most part, train travel is already one of the best economic um, routes for UK tourists to take. But considering the app with um, offered discounts for those who have taken train travel, um, we hope this this would encourage people to take it as a more economic alternative. Maybe not the rail companies themselves would be playing the part in that area, but it would certainly help for the UK tourists. Are there any further questions? Hi there, this is Al. I'm just um, jumping in. I'm not necessarily going to hog the, the limelight from the, and the questions. Um, I was just um, having a quick chat there with Kim, who, as you can see now, has said that they're having a bit of trouble unmuting. Um, but Kim, do you have any um, any particular comments? Are you, are you able to unmute now? Or if there not, we go. Is that working excellent. now? Fab, we can totally hear you. This is, this is <laughs> Gloria. I knew there would be some. Oh my goodness. Oh, sorry, I typed it in a message. <laughs> I typed in a message and then it disappeared and then I couldn't get my uh, audio to work. Um, thank you so much, Team Six. Um, what a fantastic start. Um, and thank you for your presentation. I do have a couple of questions that I was maybe wondering if you could um, give me some thoughts about. Um, in your report, you suggested that there could potentially be a, a kind of a legacy benefit to running something like this in one destination where people would uh, take their changed behaviours back, you know, and then that would spread kind of good behaviour in terms of travel when they kind of go home and are going about their business. Um, do you know if there's any evidence from the Bologna example that kind of suggests, although I think it was a two six month trials beyond just what they did there, did you did you come across anything that kind of suggests that that might have a lasting effect? Well, I think if no one else is going to answer this, um, there were actually a few papers, not necessarily on the Better Points app, but um, there were a few papers on Canadian festivals that suggested um, festivals with a culture of sustainability about them um, often have better benefits on when their tourists travel home, as in they'll carry those behaviours with them. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> maybe not the most scientific term, but we kind of, while we were thinking about a project, we called it a vibe. I think um, the app would the app would contribute to that vibe in Edinburgh as a green city, especially when, uh, as we said, the app itself would contain messages and encourage tell people about inform consumers about the benefits. And we thought we'd be we're thinking that um, since it's it would be contribu contributing to this culture, uh, it would carry that home. Mm -hmm. So I think she's got her hand raised. Yeah, Jonathan, if you don't mind me jumping in. Um, I think also, um, from the very beginning, we did uh, say as a team that we wanted Edinburgh, um, as we mentioned in that video there, we go into a little bit more detail. Um, it's been ranked the greenest uh, and most innovative city within the UK. And we really felt that there was um, space there for Edinburgh to become the benchmark standard for sustainable uh, domestic tourism for Europe and even perhaps the world. So that was something I know it's very ambitious and aspirational, but we believe that if it can happen anywhere, it could happen in Edinburgh, for Edinburgh to really set a standard for sustainability um, within the tourism sector. That can be um, kind of have a cascading effect, even as tourists leave, as, John as Jonathan said. Hi, sorry, I also was just having trouble with my internet there. Um, but just to pull in on the Bella Mosa case study, I don't think, um, there was any particular um, data from the case study itself that the Better Points app that um, contributed to the, the scheme um, did to say that tourists went on and or or people who use the app went on and used it to, or continued these behaviors at home. But um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that these uh, case studies are quite successful because they 
incentivize this kind of sustainable travel and also um, the app used gamification elements so it allowed um, users to compete against each other and that encouraged um, them to reduce their uh, single-use car travel as well. Great, thank you. Oh, hi, yes, I was just going to build upon the points that um, Nisha, Jonathan and Elizabeth have already said, um, and I agree mm -hmm. with that all. Um, so the Better Points app um, research did not actually give us any justification for that um, line of reasoning. That was more from the consumer insights that we had, particularly the um, Crest survey, which said that um, tourists would love to have like a kind of um, internally transformational journey when they go um, somewhere on vacation and mm -hmm. um, Edinburgh being known as um, the greenest city in the UK we thought that it had the capacity to impart um, more sustainable travel practices um, through the education and incentivization of the app. Great. Great. Hi everyone. Oh, sorry. I was just going to jump in there. Apologies for that. I, um, this is this is out. I'm just going to the, the first time that it's run is often the most most tricky. I was just going to ask on behalf there of um, Group Six. Were there any other questions? Um, there don't appear to be any more questions going forward. So, um, could I please invite um, everyone watching this afternoon to uh, share their virtual appreciation of? Uh, what an amazing kind of start to um, this afternoon has been there from um, from Group Six, um, and it's kind of set it's setting a really positive tone right here um, that we've the, that Group Six to Ten have been able to create about um, tourists coming into Edinburgh and once they're here. Um, so we'll uh, move on um, to uh, Group Seven. Um, and they'll uh, they'll introduce themselves in a moment. Like I've said, this isn't the this isn't the end of the conversations to be had, um, but just the start of um, many um, opportunities and avenues. So if I could hand over to someone from Group 7, that'd be fantastic. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. We are ST Group 7. My name is James, and I am a fourth year sustainable development student. Um, my name is Danielle, and I'm a fourth year biochemistry student. I am Valentina, I come from Italy, and I'm going into third year biotechnology. My name is Kai, um, I am in between my second and third years of ecology. My name is Blossom, I'm getting into my second year of chemical engineering. My name is Kevin, I'm going to my... My name is Esme, and I'm going into second year Chinese and Spanish. And hi, my name is Anastasia. I'm going to my third year as a cognitive science student. James? We would like to thank Edinburgh Tourism Action Group and the Students as Change Agents team for providing us with the opportunity to take part in this program. We would like to give an extra special thanks to Rachel Chisholm, our group coach, who has supported our ideas, efforts and enthusiasm, providing insightful guidance which helped fine tune our final proposal. Our challenge statement is improving routes to the Royal Yacht Britannia through public and community art spaces. We arrived at our specific challenge area and solution by brainstorming social, economic and environmental sustainability issues with pre-COVID-19 tourism. To begin, we used Vis Visit Scotland data shared by Satcher, which indicated there was more tourism in central Edinburgh than in Leith and New Haven. This prompted us to look at the relative deprivation of areas and further possible solutions. We used resources to validate our, our ideas, such as ETAG annual reports, as well as peer-reviewed articles and reliable West websites, especially the Trust Stands website. We use platforms like Mural and Google Docs to collaborate online, visualise, compare and refine our ideas and eventually decide on our cycle route. We worked hard to ensure that our solution made sustainable changes that would not limit the culture and social experience of Edinburgh tourism. 
So along the way, we did encounter several challenges, such as developing a specific solution from such an open-ended problem. So we had a couple of different directions about where we want to go, developing an app with an idea as well as a map with local businesses, uh, as well as trying to find a solution that balanced both tourism development as well as the needs of the residents being heard. We also had some difficulty finding data specific to our challenge solution, such as bike numbers, specifically in lease, as well as tourism numbers in lease. And of course, adapting to working online and dealing with technical difficulties as everyone I imagine have encountered. But we did persevere and we did have skills that we developed in the end, such as digital creative skills, learning how to use new platforms, such as Microsoft Teams and Mural, collaborating online with those, as well as teamwork and division of labor, interpersonal and communication skills were also improved, as well as data analysis. So thank you so much for listening and we hope you enjoy our video. When first beginning research into the project, it became apparent that international tourism within Edinburgh is largely concentrated to one specific area of the town. This is due to the popularity of the castle and the Royal Mile, as well as various museums and galleries only being a short walk away. However, other famous attractions in Edinburgh, such as the Royal Yacht Britannia, are overlooked somewhat due to its distance away from other main attractions, as well as there is less there being less advertising towards it, therefore resulting in lower tourism numbers to the Royal Yacht Britannia. There are four major challenges that tourism faces due to the impact of COVID-19. Social distancing poses significant problems to tourist attractions. Travel restrictions and reduced flights limit the number of international tourists. Fear of a second wave causes uncertainties when planning future events. And the pandemic imposed temporary deglobalization urges tourism to reboot with domestic We propose to create a safe and accessible route for cyclists and pedestrians, connecting the old town and city centre of Edinburgh to the Royal Yacht Britannia in New Haven. This route could pass through some of Edinburgh's many beautiful green and historic open spaces, which could also host performances, art installations and markets that substantially involve local communities. The route would help to spread tourism throughout Edinburgh, down to Leith and New Haven, whilst acting as a tourist destination in itself. Locals may benefit from increased income and community cohesion that spaces along the route may provide. The Green Cycle Route has benefits for both visitors and residents. Visitors can help motivate the spread of tourism by visiting other parts of the city. They can also help offset greenhouse gas emissions by being less reliant on cars and tour buses. And cycling is the ideal social distancing activity post-COVID-19. Residents can also enjoy the benefits of reduced air pollution. Safer roads for families and disabled residents are also a benefit of cycling routes. And there will be reduction in socioeconomic exclusion by giving access to healthcare, employment, and other services previously made unavailable by lack of cars and lack of public transportation in certain areas of the city. Ember Council has committed to building a new cycle network which runs across the Royal Mile before turning down the mound and along Hanover Street. We suggest EPTAC promote the expansion of this route along Queen Street so it can pass Calton Hill before turning down Easter Road. The route would end in a loop directed towards Ocean Terminal. This directs tourists away from the Lee Street cycle lane, which Sustrans has identified is already overcrowded. Instead, they are guided along green and blue space, creating an appealing link directly from the Royal Mile to the Royal Yacht. The Leith and New Haven Community Council published an agenda covering green issues tackle according to the population. Among these, there was taking care of the environment, maintaining a diverse and multicultural community, avoiding asset degradation, and local empowerment. I'm currently standing in a Leith theatre, refurbished in 2017. In our vision, we want to take care of the community's yeah. ideas and opinions, and create more public spaces for gatherings. We would like to collaborate with the local artists, such as the Dock Art Space, the Public House Art Studios, or the Biscuit Factory. We have tried to reduce the effects of some challenges to our solution. In order to prevent the gentrification of Leith and New Haven, we intend to work very closely with local communities in order to ensure that our solution brings prosperity to local residents. We also want to ensure that accessibility is not a problem for anyone.
We will follow the National Cycle Network's design principles so that the routes designed for use by people of all ages and abilities and all types of cycles. Our route will follow the National Network's guidance in using, where possible, wide quiet roads and green spaces. That are centered around empowering the new haven and lead communities who will have effects like number one, there will be more increased economic prosperity of the surrounding communities. Number two, there will be a greater community cohesion. Number three, there is increase in environmental sustainability through the use of bicycles. In a group, we sought out three types of sustainabilities. Sustainability of tourism in Edinburgh on the societal fabric of New Haven and the Lead. Number two, sustainability on the environment through the use of bikes as a form of transportation. Number three, sustainability on the infrastructure of tourism hotspots. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for listening and for watching our video. And we'd like to invite anyone to ask any questions they'd like to pose. Thank you, Ruth, for your feedback. I will read it out loud if that's OK. Uh, this, uh, she said that ours is an excellent idea and particularly timely given the current interest in cycling. Thank you. You're welcome. I didn't move on. Yeah, I've got a question as, as well. I'm I'm a very keen cyclist, so I would love to see this happening. Have you given any thought, and apologies if I missed this, to how you would um, resource this interest and um, this huge number of extra people who would be needing to get access to bikes? And also how you would um, overcome the skeptics who think that cycling is dangerous, um, you need the right equipment, it's too far, it's too hilly, etc. Blossom, would you so, um, take this question too? One, it's fine. Um, so like in terms of um, like if more people happen to need the bicycles. We had thought of it in this way. We thought that um, this would actually mean that another form of business would come into play, which is a uh, bike rental businesses. They would really flourish and would have more bike um, rental businesses coming into play, which means more people will actually uh, get to get employed um, in such businesses. So that's one, that's one way we're thinking of it to say, would then turn out to be another business venture um, on its own. And then about bicycles not being um, safe and everything else, we're thinking of like raising awareness, making people more aware of the advantages associated with riding a bike, like the health advantages of it, and also helping them with um, safety tips when riding a bike. And because this is the route, we're expecting it to like, um not have like um to like when people are crossing main roads and stuff to make it um, more safe and adaptable to the safety part of it in terms of maybe uh crashing into a car and and stuff like that so uh, and that's also one of the reasons why it's going to be passing through so many green spaces to avoid uh, the main roads and and um everything else associated with it so yeah that's what we had kind of like thought of along those those lines I hope I've answered your question. Thanks, Boston. Could I also add just um, a little something to that as well, if that's OK? Um, how, yeah, we just really like to work with um, We like to work with charities, um, lots of cycling charities that uh, exist in Edinburgh at the moment and uh, initiatives and um, for the creation of, of this cycle network and extension of the proposed route already we'd like to um work with local councils um hopefully with the support of the would be really beneficial um and yeah some cycle charities in edinburgh for example are doing um 
things like um, free cycle lessons on at, at the moment for people who are um, uncomfortable, let's say, with cycling. And yeah, there's a great momentum already behind cycling in Edinburgh. So we think this idea could really take off. I think Daniela has um, her hand raised. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Just, uh, sorry. Just to um, piggyback off of uh, Kai uh, and his point. As uh, so apologies for not being able to share my video. I seem to have quite poor connection at the minute. Um, but in terms of the um, charities and getting involved in the local council, in terms of um, promoting cycling and using of of the cycle routes um i think that would really help in terms of um sort of answering to uh, skeptics of um, using cycle routes and using bicycles within the city um i know that quite a few cities across uh, both scotland and england do um do courses that help people increase their confidence when on a bike and i think that would in order to give those kind of resources to people, you'd be able to make it possible to see that people can use cycling. I know that I myself have used one of those schemes and that has enabled me to um, cycle around Edinburgh and do so feeling confident and doing so safely. Um, so I think that if we were to promote this kind of cycle route, we would also try and promote those kinds of schemes. Um, yeah, sorry, just to add to that, uh, like we said in the video, we have chosen routes that are less busy and as where possible, we are trying to go through green spaces. So we really do want to avoid <coughs> large, um, very busy roads that do normally put people off cycling. The key road we avoided was the Leaf Street cycle lane. Um, which was a contentious issue for us because tapping into it could have reduced costs for the um, proposal, as well as providing a more direct link to the Royal Yacht Britannia. However, we felt that because Sustrans had already identified this cycle lane is overcrowded as it is, bringing tourists directly into this area would actually make the route more dangerous, which is why we decided to turn down Easter Road instead. I think Kim has her hand raised. I do, yeah. Um, thank you very much for another great presentation and another great video. Um, I really liked that you um, touched on the kind of the needs to balance the locals versus the tourists. Um, and um, there was a, a line in the report about how uneven spread is bad, whether it's because there's too many tourists or because there's not enough and that the, there's a risk of gentrification. And that's another negative point. Um, and I think that's something that uh, we as ETAG are really dealing with at the moment um, and also um, I, I live in Leith and I'm although I'm not a cyclist so uh, maybe this is something that I need to get in on. Um, I guess I had a couple of questions one was around you know just what do you th I mean, you maybe actually already answered this but what do you think the biggest challenge about getting this implemented would be? If there was one barrier that you think you could overcome? Yeah, I think Kai has his hand raised up. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, um, I think it's that um, we need to, there need to be extensive uh, counselling with local councils and communities on the proposed route as well. And that would be a big um, aspect of the project first. And also, um, yeah, the, the permission and planning is there's a lot of administrative staff, I guess, that would come with that. Would anyone else, um, does anyone else have any insights into other major challenges that could come with it? Uh, yeah, I think um, I would really agree with Kai on this point in that uh, I think there would have to be quite a lot of local support for it due to the disruption that it would cause in order to implement the cycle route um, in terms of making sure that all the safety measures were in place. Um, so I think that making sure that it is wanted both in the local area as well as being used by tourists would be a major point. And Kevin has his hand raised too, so just go ahead. Um, yes, I would also like to add that um, visibility of the route would also be one of the challenges, meaning that we would need to figure out how to make tourists aware of the route 
and if possible make the cycle route somehow of a specialty of Edinburgh tourism and tourism in Leith? Um, yeah, sorry, just to jump on the back of that as well. Um, I think the problem um, of the uh, getting the community involved in the cycle route is definitely really important. I think another factor is accessibility, especially when crossing roads, things like this, and having um, adequate spaces for people to park non-standard cycles and to have routes that really are adapted to that because from a lot of research in accessibility that's something that needs to be greatly improved for a large community of um, disabled people who want to cycle but don't have the infrastructure so it's something that I'm really passionate that I would want that to be seen in there. Mm -hmm. Great thank you. Hi everyone, this is Al jumping in again. Um, I just wanted to say um, uh, thank you very much um, uh, uh, to you guys um, and Group 7 there for, for um, giving us a, some real uh, food for thought in terms of moving the, um, moving the traffic out, um, the, the tourist traffic out from the city centre, but actually doing it in a really sustainable way. I think it was a really well thought through and well, um, well curated video as well. So if I could ask um, um, participants in today's conversation to uh, celebrate um, uh, the group there um, and give them a round of applause. That would be um, fantastic. Yeah, it's a very silent round of applause, you'll notice, um, but it is very heartfelt, um, definitely. Um, so now if we can um, move along to group um, group eight, um, to if you can share your video, I really appreciate that the internet seems to be much poorer um, in the afternoons. Um, so if you're able to share your video, if not, um, uh, if you can, please do, but if you can't, it is absolutely fine. Um, so um, over to Group 8, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're ST Group 8, and my name is Rory. We also have Prerna, Shayu, Josephine, Alex, Caroline, and Pat. We'd like to extend our thanks to ETAG, the Students as Change Agents team, and our group coach, Lauren McLaren, for her assistance and guidance to us in completing this task. I'll now pass over to Caroline to introduce our group video. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. Um, in tackling this challenge, we felt as a group that pollution and congestion in the city centre were problems that needed to be addressed. Through research, we discovered that the low emission zone will be established in Edinburgh City Centre in late 2020. While this will discourage car and taxi use, we felt that more could be done to encourage people, especially tourists, onto buses. In discussion, it's become apparent that we all thought that the current transport for Edinburgh app was lacking in many respects. Therefore, we decided to focus our attention on how the app could be improved to make the movement to a low emission zone as impactful as possible. We hope you enjoy the video. Al, would you mind popping the video on for us? Thanks. Hi guys, Travel Blogger 1612 here. Just got back from a sunny trip to Edinburgh and I can tell everybody it's an absolutely stunning place to visit. Five star scenery, five star restaurants, five star attractions. The only downside, the public transport. I couldn't make head or tail of it. I downloaded the local transport app when I arrived and that's when my problems started. I wanted to visit Britannia. The app said a bus was five minutes away. I went to the bus stop, was waiting there like a plonker for 15 minutes. The next day, I went to visit the Botanic Gardens, thinking the app would tell me when to get off the bus. I should be so lucky. I missed the bloody stop. I ended up in the middle of nowhere with only myself for company. Same thing happened when I tried to get to the zoo. So take it from me. Edinburgh, fantastic place to visit. But if you're venturing anywhere beyond walking distance, call a cab. It's just simpler. Think back. Think back to your last city break. Where were you? What did you see? What attractions did you visit? Now think about how you traveled around the city. Did you walk, cycle, take public transport, 
or was it easier to get a taxi around town? Whatever the case, it's likely your decision was influenced primarily by one thing, convenience. After all, you were on holiday. Taking public transport in a foreign city can be daunting, and often holidaymakers find it more convenient to travel by car. However, by the end of 2020, Edinburgh city centre will be a low emission zone. This will reduce the number of private cars and taxis that can access the city centre. This is a golden opportunity to encourage more people on the buses. And by improving the current Transport for Edinburgh app, we're intent on making bus travel the most convenient option for Edinburgh's visitors and residents. The current app has a rating of 2.7 on the App Store. Its shortcomings typically relate to tracking and timetable inaccuracies, together with difficulty in planning journeys. These make travelling by bus more inconvenient for visitors. Similar apps, such as CityMapper, have a 4.4 rating. Users value its simple-to-use interface, telling a traveller everything they need to know, as well as the app's accuracy and its feature that reminds users to get off the bus at their desired stop. By adopting these features in an improved app and promoting it at ports, bus stops and hotels, bus travel is more likely to be the natural choice for everyone. And more bus use means more capital to invest in green technology, which means less emissions and a healthier society. Let's see what travel blogger 1612 might think of the app on his next visit. Hi guys, just back on a sunny trip to Edinburgh. What a difference a year makes. Five star scenery, five star restaurants, and five star attractions, but five star public transport now as well. The city feels like a completely different place. The centre of town is a low emission zone, so it's a bit less congested and more pleasant to explore. It's more difficult to get a cab, but that's not a problem because the public transport is so much easier to use than last year. When I landed at the airport, there were lots of posters for the new and improved transport app. I was a bit sceptical at first, but I downloaded and I have to say, it made my trip so much easier. The bus tracker was actually accurate and my phone told me when my stop was coming up. So if you need to get to Britannia or the Botanic Gardens or the zoo, just download the transport app. It will tell you exactly how to get there and it's easier and cheaper than getting a cab. Sorry, many thanks for screening that, Al. Um, we'd like to invite any questions from the group, if there are any. Sorry, my computer is being a bit slow here. Thank you very much, Lauren. So Ruth is asking, have you thought how you would persuade Transport for Edinburgh to take on board this idea? Um, I think I'll, I'll be happy to field that one. Um, well, I think they they themselves have an interest in taking it on because they would get more passengers, both residents and tourists. And I'm sure they would be happy to see that 2.7 rating climb on the App Store. Um, so I don't really feel like it would they, they would need much persuading and I think that um, the investment required it would also be it might be an option to lobby the Scottish government for funds when you think that Edinburgh has been well Edinburgh has declared itself want, wanting itself to be carbon neutral by 2030 so there is political pressure for a move towards greater public transport and a move towards um, just more sustainable travel really so I we really feel as a team that this this is a, a project that many different parties
parties would be interested, actively interested in, in taking part in. Oh, I, sorry, I can see Al's got his hand up. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, uh, one, wonderful video. Thank you um, uh, so much uh, to, 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 to you and whoever the vlogger was, right? Um, uh, so um, I wanted to ask, so of all of, the, um, of all of the options that were available to you as a group, um, how, did you, um, how did you work together um, to arrive at um, uh, looking at bus travel and the app in particular? I think, um, Alex, would you want to take this up? Because it was Alex was really the the person who spearheaded this particular idea. Uh, sure, I'm happy to uh, talk about this one. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Great. So um, as we were working through the different um, tasks on Mural, we felt as though um, taking it, looking at like the broad picture, um, we wanted to focus in on how we could attempt to um, make Edinburgh more like a more environmentally friendly city. So we went and started looking at possible ways to reduce emissions uh, in the city in general. And we realized that uh, transportation was probably the uh, one of the biggest contributors to emissions in Edinburgh, but also globally. Uh, and I think in Edinburgh, it accounts for roughly 60% of Edinburgh emissions is through all forms of transport. So narrowing it down, we thought that um, as uh, the city center is trying to become a um, low emission zone, that the most appropriate form of transport, uh, public transport would be through the use of buses and to reduced number of cars on the road. And in order to tackle that problem, we had a few different options of either looking at um, encouraging and increasing uh, public transport through awareness and accessibility, and also through potentially trying to make uh, the buses more environmentally friendly. Um, however, we realized that the latter um, strategy was already already being implemented by Transport for Edinburgh, where they were trying to put more um, electric buses on the road. So we decided to go towards the transport uh, ease side of the problem. As I don't know if anyone else has tried to use the app, but personally, I've had experiences standing around waiting for a bus to come, only to find out that there was a protest up the road that was blocking it or something like that. I would miss, basically missed my whole lecture. So we felt as though trying to redesign the app to make it uh, easier for what we called them um, disadvantaged users. And one of those major groups is tourists coming to the city for the first time and not really knowing their way around Edinburgh. And if they felt as though they could be more confident with the public transport app, we felt as though it would really boost their opportunity and availability to use public transport instead of taking a black cab to get to their destination. That's fantastic. Um, uh, th thanks so much, Alex. And, and yes, I, I do have the app and would like the app to be much, much better. Um, so I'm actually just going to now I'm just say, like, Kim, do you have any comments you'd like to share? Yeah, thanks, uh, teammate. That's another another great presentation. Um, I suppose I was thinking. I guess there's two. Uh, so I, first of all, I like that you've um, picked up on an existing kind of solution and uh, kind of just found a way to to think about making it better. Did you get any sense? I was surprised by how low the app rating was. Although I've got issues with it myself, but um, I hadn't appreciated it was quite as bad as that. Um, did you get a sense from the feedback maybe through that about whether the issue is particularly with the service, the actual bus service, or if it's specific issues with the app? And then, sorry, this is the second question as well. Um, was there anything that you found in your research that was perhaps about specifically to um, tourist users and maybe language issues with access in the app? Maybe translations and things like that? I think just to answer the, the first half of your question, um, we didn't find that there, was, there wasn't there was much dissatisfaction with the, the way the buses operated. 
it was predominantly complaints about the app's inaccuracy and the the difficulty people had in planning their route. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't really used the much sorry the app much myself, but having read some of the reviews, um, that was the main bone of contention. Whereas when you read the city mapper reviews, um, the the compliments of it tended to be about its comprehensiveness and it really was a one-stop shop where you could type in where you were where you were going and the app would do the work for you and that seemed to be what was really missing from from the Lothian app mm -hmm. and then Alex would you be happy answering the second half of the regard the research uh, yeah so just just to confirm the, the second question was about um, possible barriers such as language issues for the users? Yeah, exactly. Right. So um, I had a little look at the app and um, I'm not aware that there were other language options. Um, I'm sure there, there, that must be the case that there are some. But with my quick look through the app and looking at the options and the settings, I couldn't really find an easy way to swap language. And as it primarily would be downloaded in English, I would assume that it would be difficult for other users to find the opportunity, uh, the option to swap languages as well. Hmm. So if that is a current feature, which it very well might be, but I wasn't able to find it, then another opportunity is to make it more uh, uh, prominent within the app so that you can quickly change your language if you're from a non-English speaking country. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? It's always an awkward moment, Rory, because you don't know how long someone might be taking <laughs> to type out a question. Um, but we will, it doesn't look like anything's coming in and no one's raising their hands. Um, so I will just throw out to um, my thanks to all of you in the group. Uh, for creating um, uh, that video and that report and doing all of the research behind it um, in um, in creating your findings and creating some ideas that are really useful. Um, and we will see how we can get them to uh, Lothian buses um, and transport them. So um, if we could show our appreciation to everyone in the group, that'd be fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Um, so now we come to uh, Group 10, so if uh, Sustainable Tourism Group 10 could um, uh, ready themselves to uh, present, I will stop my camera and uh, set the video up. Thank you. Hi there, I hope everything's okay tech-wise. Um, we're Group 10. I'm Beth and I'll be introducing our project today with Jasmine. Our other members are Marina, Beatrice, Hannah and Kyle. Uh, we're all from different degree backgrounds, ranging from law to biomedical sciences to robotics, uh, from first years to third years to postgrad. We were interested from the beginning to see how we would each approach the topic and what we'd end up eventually focusing on. Uh, thankfully, interest aside, we were able to focus our topic and gradually came to a conclusion that we'd focus on local sourcing. We came to this by breaking down the question into its three parts, the post-COVID world, tourism industry, and environmental sustainability. I thought that tackling the food industry would be an ideal way to encompass all these aspects and would be especially relevant um, in relation to COVID-19. Whilst our original ideas were around dealing with food waste, after further research, brainstorming, and some interviews with local businesses, we shifted to local sourcing, a topic that seemed more approachable, feasible, and interesting. Perfect. Um, so we definitely had some challenges along the way. At the beginning, this was mainly trying to find relevant data that would support our topic, which is why we eventually did transition to focusing on local sourcing. After this, our main struggle was trying to think of a solution that was helpful and feasible. And for us as students, the day to day running of a business is not something that we usually think about. So trying to think outside of the box to create a solution that would actually be helpful is definitely a challenge. And that's where the interviews with business owners were helpful to give us an idea of how businesses run, how you source your food and how we could expand our solution ideas. 
And the other challenge, which I think like everyone has mentioned, is working together over Teams, which was a platform that was new to all of us. Um, we're able to overcome these challenges and it has expanded our skills as a result. So our issue with data forced us to research smartly and effectively. Our issues with our solution developed our evaluative skills and data analysis skills. And our meetings over Teams being interrupted by poor Wi-Fi or our different time zones definitely improved our time management and communication skills. And finally, putting this all into a presentation to you today has allowed us to build upon our team and skills. And I think it's safe to say on behalf of the team that this has been a really fun and enjoyable experiences despite these challenges. And we've all had a great time getting to know each other on the project. So first, we would like to thank you, the organizers, for putting this together. Um, also for ETAG for providing us with the data sources when we were desperate. Um, our coach, Kerry, for her continued enthusiasm and support. And to the field restaurant and Mimi's Bakery for answering our hopefully not too naive questions. So that's everything from us and I hope you enjoy our video. Now to this story, how this global pandemic has changed our relationship with food from panic buying. The food service industry is being hard hit right but now. But there are millions of people out there that work in restaurants that create beauty for us every single day, and they have no safety net. The tourism and food industry have been severely hit by COVID-19. International tourist numbers could fall between 60 to 80 percent, and global trade is estimated to fall by 27 percent this year. The food industry is also suffering with widespread closures due to the reduced number of visitors. This, in turn, has an impact on suppliers as the reduced demand causes prices of agricultural commodities to drop by 20 percent. To combat this, we are suggesting an increase in local sourcing. This will ensure that Edinburgh's food tourism industry is economically resilient to any future challenges while also providing an exciting opportunity to connect with local farmers. There are several environmental advantages of locally sourcing produce. Shorter, more local supply chains that bypass unnecessary packaging and provide a more transparent service will reduce the amount of waste and plastic use. Buying local food could also reduce the average consumer's greenhouse gas emissions by 4-5%. to Furthermore, local small-scale farming can be cultivated in a sustainable way by adopting methods such as crop rotation or encouraging insects to promote the health of crops and reduce the use of pesticides. Food tourism is a crucial player in Edinburgh's tourism as a whole. From a survey from Visit Scotland, 58% of the visitors said they would enjoy dining experience with locally sourced food. As ETAG reported, 70% of potential visitors to Scotland say they would like to sample traditional dishes, regional specialities and fresh local produce and are willing to pay 3-15% to more for it. Thus, supporting local sourcing would help sustain Edinburgh's flourishing food tourism sector. Increasing local spending will revive the tourist industry as most money spent with local businesses typically get re-spent in the local economy on wages, local suppliers or many other services. For instance, spending £10 in a local food outlet is actually worth £25 to the local economy as it gets re-spent locally several times. Not to mention that developing local supply chains will also create more jobs within Scotland for all levels of the economy. Our proposed solution was created after interviewing local business owners and listening to their needs. Nowadays, many businesses want to source locally, but are limited by the lack of knowledge of Scottish produce or are deterred by having to communicate and cooperate with a range of new suppliers. That's why we suggest a non-profit business wholesaler that links the food and tourism industries with suppliers in a hassle-free way. It will be essentially a wholesaler that is exclusively locally sourced. The wholesaler will have a relationship with local suppliers and forward knowledge of the quantities they supply and when as to estimate an over-demand. Once catering businesses place an order, the wholesaler will then organize the sourcing, storing and delivery of the products while also covering the administration for the business. While this initiative would receive initial funding from government or external partner, it will become self-sustainable by the charging of a competitive processing fee. We see this solution 
as a sustainable alternative for businesses to use when they see fit, especially aimed for startups and larger businesses that will need those starting connections to support their transition to local produce. It aims to build up contacts and connections with local farmers that businesses were otherwise not aware of, whilst ensuring local sourcing is made simple and accessible to all business types. Is that we're, as a nation, not that aware of how much of our food is exported, particularly shellfish and seafood. I mean, it's something ridiculous, like 75% of the langoustine catch is in Scotland, but it's all been exported. Our recommendation is not for businesses to solely rely on local produce, as we understand not all ingredients can be locally sourced. Instead, we want businesses to increase local sourcing products that are already available in Scotland, such as seafood. The reality is that this will be a slow transition, allowing for suppliers and businesses alike to adapt to the new demand for Scottish produce. We envision that by proudly encouraging local food and tourist businesses, tourism will not only indirectly aid the local economy post-COVID-19, but it will also build a closer and more cooperative city. Yeah, so thank you for watching our video and presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to discuss. Uh, so it was a question uh, by Ruth, excellent introduction of video, thank you very much. Did you find any data to evidence that there are enough local food sources to cater for the demand from tourists? Um, we didn't look directly into capacity because we felt that the, the suggestion was more that it just should be um, done more often rather than fully relied on. Um, for instance, you can't, or you obviously can't get every type of food imported, so it would have to very uh, depending on the produce um, but we believe if we like encourage more uh, businesses to to take that route then it'll create more demand and therefore farmers would look to expand uh, another question from al um, did you experience any particular challenges in arriving at your proposed solution uh, yeah, so originally this wasn't our solution until we spoke with the two businesses. Um, so originally we'd envisioned a sort of virtual marketplace where you could have individual stores um, having their own sort of embedded website uh, on one platform. But after we spoke with a few the the businesses, they kind of suggested that the one of the reasons that they enjoy using local produce is the sort of relationships you build with the um, producers uh, and that was when the wholesale was suggested um, so that was when we started developing that idea as well uh, and I think also kind of collecting qualitative data um, took a bit of digging to find uh, the data that we needed and the data that we wanted to use um, but eventually we found something which just took, took a while to, to find. And also, as mentioned in our introduction, we really didn't know what went on in organizing a business. So we had to like learn the process and how they had to create invoices and organize deliveries in order to come to this conclusion that a wholesaler would be better than an individual website. Yeah, I think that was one of the, the main reasons that this was more attractive is that companies just don't have the, the overhead to deal with all of the invoices and receipts and they'd rather have somebody else handle it for them. So there's a hand up. Yeah, there's a hand up. Yeah, um, thanks. Another fantastic presentation um, and thank you for the video. Um, this is something um, that I think probably we as ETAC haven't, haven't thought about a lot. Um, I was just wondering, um, I'm really uh, interested in the idea of the, the kind of the wholesaler question. I don't know that I've heard of that. And I just wondered if you'd come across anywhere else where anything similar was being done or if this was something that you kind of developed completely new or if you found any other examples anywhere. 
Yes, I think I'm going to hand this question over. <laughs> I can do that one. Um, when we were talking to the restaurants, there was some links to other wholesalers. I think some, there's like a couple in Glasgow on a smaller scale. Um, also, um, Leftfield Edinburgh told us about this app that's been developed in London, which kind of does a similar thing apart from it's on an app. Um, and as Carl's already said, we kind of this wholesaler that had a more social aspect to it. Um, so there are like things starting to be developed, which we definitely pulled ideas from. But we really wanted this to be based in Scotland and for Scottish produce and that to really be promoted. Great, thank you. Um, and did you put any thought into sort of how you might um, so that's kind of this is a sort of behind the scenes solution is you know it's about business processes and which is great but um any thoughts about how you would promote that to tourists to kind of um, make them aware of how it's been done or would that be down to the individual businesses to to promote that message i think in terms of i suppose it would maybe be down to local businesses to sort of promote that they are using local produce because i think when the data that we did find sort of suggested that um tourism were inclined to to maybe want to sample local food and want to try local produce and, and they're willing to pay more money for it so i think um i mean we, we could definitely look into to advertising it but i think if restaurants set, sort of like push that as a selling point um then that would tie in well with the idea and also what was what we learned from our interview with the owner of Leth field Edinburgh was that it's really nice for you to know the story of where the produce is coming and the ethics of the farmer so that should also be emphasized to the restaurants buying the food so that should be emphasized in like the website and by the wholesaler so the wholesaler would advertise the ethics to the restaurants and the restaurants could pass it on to their tourists to their clients great thank you uh, there's another question in the chat box uh, from Kai. So what do you think uh, the biggest challenges might be in establishing this, this cooperative wholesaler? Um, I think the logistics of it might be, although like wholesalers do obviously exist, so it's not necessarily a, a, a new thing. It's just that it's very locally sourced. So I think actually getting in contact with um, the producers of the food and establishing this network um, would be quite a big challenge because um, obviously you have to have collaboration from all areas for it to actually work. Um, I think the the original overhead of setting it up in terms of funding as well, you could you could need quite a uh, a large base to get the company off the uh, up and running. Um, but we have we did identify in our report a few areas where funding may come from. Um, yeah, if anybody else has anything to add. Um, yeah, I feel like another big. No, I feel like another big thank you would be that they they the initial funding needs an application so we need to organize a group to like start the actual initial funding before any money comes in. I was just gonna say, um, Kai, you said that you're part of the Hearty Squirrel food co-op and that's one of the things that we considered when we were talking about this. Um, I used the Hearty Squirrel at Edinburgh and um, it was something that we considered um yeah in our idea and the Whitmore farm that you have a link with uh we did some of our research on that um so yeah we'd love for you to get involved too if this goes any further thank you Hi everyone, this is Al again jumping in um, uh, and I think we'll um, uh, um, finish, uh, finish there with group, uh, group 10. Um, again, thank you, thank you again for such, a, such an incredible um, idea and how you put everything together um, and you've really brought through the, the community element there which I think is, is so important um, but often lost when talking about um, uh, tourism. Um, uh, so if we can, um, those of us that are watching, if we're able to uh, uh, show a virtual round of applause again um, in the in the chat box, that would be uh, really um, really uh, really good, and uh, show our appreciation of all the amazing hard work that was put into there. Um, so uh, we have one more presentation to go, uh, one more group to uh, speak to you.
Um, so that is uh, Group 9. And so um, I will now hand over to a representative from uh, ST Group 9 uh, while I set your video up. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to listen to our work today. Just a wee intro to our group. Our group's a small one of only five members, including myself, Ruby, a robotics PhD student. Um, hi, my name is Eva. I'm a second year neuroscience student going into third year. Hello, my name is Eugene, and I'm studying business management and marketing, and I'm going into my second year. Um, I'm Oriel. I'm a second year geography student. Um, uh, I want to start by saying thank you to everyone at ETAG and students as change agents for making this project possible. And thank you as well to our group coach, Joshua, who was a great help over the past few weeks. Um, doing something like this, working in a team and creating a project like this, but entirely online, was something completely new to me and to quite a few others here as well. So I'm very grateful to have this experience and to be able to explore the issue of sustainable tourism in Edinburgh. Um, in terms of our project, we focused on hotels pretty quickly at the beginning, as we found from looking at the data that hotels are the most popular form of tourist accommodation. And with millions of tourists visiting each year and the huge energy costs of the hotel in industry, a solution implemented here could have wide reaching effects. So our project has focused on consumer behavior and energy wastage as we tried to find a solution that could encourage a change in behavior and attitudes towards energy use in hotels. Um, to do so, we have investigated the use of smart meters in hotels to collect energy data. And our video, which I have to credit largely to Eva, was created in the app Magisto. So I'll uh, pass over to Al to screen our video now to explain further. The United Nations World Tourism Organization predicts that between 2005 and 2035, emissions from tourism will grow by 135%, contributing to the problems of environmental degradation and water scarcity. By 2030, half of the world's population will be living in areas of severe water stress. We have chosen to focus on energy usage in the hotel industry, as hotels continue to produce some of the highest energy consumption figures within the territory building sector. Approximately 60% of energy usage in hotels is accounted for by space conditioning and domestic hot water usage. Customers at hotels have control of many of these facilities, like leaving heating on, leaving the lights on, or hot water running, which are all practices that contribute to energy wastage. In Edinburgh, hotels play a large role in the future of sustainable tourism, with the city hosting over 14,000 hotel rooms. We must implement more sustainable hospitality practices that can allow Edinburgh to grow the world-class yet sustainable city. While staying away from home, the pressure to behave in an environmentally conscious way is lessened and can lead to high energy consumption. A Scandic hotel study found that the average hotel guest uses 240 litres of water per day, compared to a British study that found that the average person at home uses 142 litres per day. We want to create a solution that encourages a change in co consumer behaviour to lower energy consumption among hotel customers. To do so, we propose the use of smart meters in individual hotel rooms. By collecting and displaying hourly readings of the electricity and water used, the system gives feedback to the room occupant. This enables the consumer to be fully aware of how their actions affect their resource consumption and enables them to alter their usage. This will provide a financial motivation and reduce rates if the resource usage is kept low. There would be a base price for the length of stay in the room with the total cost of resources used added on at checkout. Secondly, there will be a social motivation. By using colour and symbols to show if the usage is above, neutral or below the average, the display will encourage the occupant to modify their consumption by adding a competitive aspect. To integrate smart meters into the hotel experience, we suggest the use of a TV interface or an app. This would allow for continuous updates from within that room based on the heating, lights and water use. Not only is this a potential system for use in hotels, but this could also be easily rolled out in Airbnb and private rental properties, as some may already have smart meters in place. One challenge is the cost of procuring smart meters, for which we will use collective bargaining. 
One organization negotiates to buy the smart meters and then distributes them to hotels and other accommodation providers. This will help to reduce the cost, but it also ensures that smaller accommodation providers don't suffer a huge burden of cost. The organization could be the Scottish Government or even the Edinburgh Council. We also suggest that the government subsidizes the cost of procuring smart meters. This would not only help the accommodation sector, but would also benefit the Scottish Government in the long term to achieve its net zero emission targets by 2045. Overall, the installation of smart meters will allow hotels to create unique marketing opportunities. External promotions to customers can be based on the unique sustainable features of these properties, delivering a positive and responsible image. Hotels can also offer unique rural programs for customers who stay in their properties and decide to use sustainable practices. The smart meter can be also be used to change consumer behavior and encourage lower energy consumption among hotel customers by providing an accurate reading of energy use for each individual room and providing a financial incentive as well as a social competition. This would not only be beneficial for the environment due to lower emissions, but also would lead to lower operating costs for hotels. Thank you everyone for taking the time to watch our video. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, a very fast one from Elsa. Um, thank you for liking the idea. Have Have you discussed this idea with any of the hotels? Sorry, I'm so bad at pronouncing words. <laughs> How have we discussed this idea with anyone from hotels in Edinburgh? What was their response? We actually didn't get as far as uh, doing any interviews. We got quite caught up in the data and looking for our own solution. It took us quite a while to decide on, fo to focus on one thing, but that's definitely something that would be a future step if this was taken further. Does anyone else in the group have anything to add? Uh, I think you covered it brilliantly. Um, if we had more time, maybe another few weeks or so, that's definitely, I think, the next step for this. Okay, that's really great to know. Thanks, Elsa. We'll definitely try and follow that up. Any other questions? Oh, um, yes, Kim has a hand raised, I think. Oh, I think uh, Kim's having some technical difficulties. Um, are you able to type out your question, Kim? Let's just, this is Al, I'm jumping in here just to, uh, just to kind of add you've identified, yes, Kim's experiencing some challenges, but in the meantime, Elsa has submitted a question for you. Okay, so Elsa is asking, how would you convince customers who are not motivated by the financial or environmental aspects? So that's where our idea of this competition came in. Everyone likes a bit of competition and so most people when they're presented with the average person's usage potentially want to use less. I know uh, the, the members of our group, we, we've agreed with that. Um, and also the use of the cognitive techniques of colour and symbols, uh, similar to those signs you see when you're driving into a new town, um, gives you a smiley face if you're under the speed limit and a frowny face if you're above. Uh, I think people underestimate the power of the power and something interesting everyone wants to get that smiley face. I, I hope that answered your question. I think Kim may, may be back in the room with a sound now. Kim, over to you.
Now, if it has frozen for Kim, then I, because it would be a shame, because I, I know we're, we are recording this, um, that if there are any other questions that, that could come in, then please raise your hand or um, type them in the, in the box. No particular questions coming, um, but question for me is, um, so, um, what kind of challenges do you see in terms of um, uh, implementing any of the any of the ideas or, or the, the idea of like the smart meter in the room? What the what what do you kind of feel, and what conversations did you have as you were um, over the last few weeks preparing for today? Um, well, I think one of the largest ones is the cost of infrastructure, which is something Ankit did a lot of research on if Ankit wants to add anything. Yeah, so I was a bit worried about the cost of infrastructure because what we looked at the price, it was around $200 for one meter, uh, for one meter. So what I thought, uh, actually the idea came was from a real world scenario. So as you know, this is a pandemic situation and uh, lots of government are trying to procure ventilators. So. In the US, there was a problem where every state was trying to get its own ventilator. So if one state was bidding for a ventilator at $500, the other would bid at $600. So, you know, there was a competition going on. So the US government, the federal government had to step in and they said that we'll be buying the ventilators for all the states and then distributing it. Now, because of that, they reduced the prices of ventilators by over 30 to 40 percent. So uh, because in this case, there was only one buyer, which was the US federal government, and there were there were many suppliers. So so I thought we could imp implement this idea in our smart meters procurement, because what can happen is that the rich hotels or the hotels which can afford to do it uh, may take away all the meters and the smaller ones won't get it. So we thought of appointing someone who could procure it for all the organ all the different accommodation sector and then distribute it on. So this will help in reducing the price a lot. This is one of the ideas we thought about. Um, and just another challenge that even just came up in discussing this challenge with my own family is that there's a, a fairly substantial number of people who don't think that smart meters are safe to be in the home, uh, never mind in a hotel. But there's actually been a, a recent study by um, Public Health England is a three-phase study showing that smart meters don't pose any harm to people and in fact they emit less radiation than the average mobile phone or smart device and on top of that we can again say that the readings are only taken per hour so it's the equivalent of sending one text message per hour and in terms of communicating this to the general public we would maybe want to do a survey so we can gauge the public opinion of the use of smart meters and then from there, we can decide what level of information to promote to everyone before trialing this in a hotel. That was great. Um, uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I've had an email from Kim who's saying that her, her computer totally froze and she's, um, she's, she's not being able to see or hear anything that's uh, come on the last minute. Um, uh, but she, I don't know if she is still here. I know she's got the, uh, the poor connection. Uh, but I'll throw it back out to Kim if she is able to come in. And I'm sorry, Kim, we're going to have to say that we can't hear you if you are talking. Um, reconnect, people, um, uh, Kim is trying to reconnect. I think we probably owe it to her having set such a, a tough challenge for everyone that see if she can come back into the room, uh, given that you've spent so much time and energy in creating um, uh, creating the, um, the your, your solution to to the challenge. that uh, shout out we really enjoyed working with you too and we really appreciated all your help and guidance 
We really have to say thank you so much because it was a really brilliant few weeks, I think. And there we go. Uh, Kim has uh, kind of uh, apologised her uh, computer is having so many issues. Um, uh, um, but I will pass over to Ruth, who has a hand raised, and then uh, Ruth will pass back to me. Yeah, I just wanted to ask while we're waiting for Kim, has anything surprised you particularly over the last few weeks um, in terms of either the challenge or how you've worked on it together? Um. I think the, the first major surprise was uh, having to work with a team that we'd never met before. Um, the, the first introduction was sort of the hardest part. And then from there, every time we met, it got easier and more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And sort of getting used to to reading other people's research that they haven't presented to you, you've done it independently, and you'll have to sort of, it's like putting a puzzle together at the end of it, because you've all worked on different pieces. But I think it's it's gone really well. And that certainly shows uh, how you've all worked well together. It, it comes across very clearly. You know, we all pretty well together. Um, that's been fantastic. Thank you so much, um, team and, and everyone um, uh, with their patience um, uh, with uh, Kim's computer. She's, she's sent me another email saying she's um, uh, really sorry and she's trying to connect. Um, but I think I'll just um, uh, hand over to uh, Ruth for some closing comments. Thank you very much. Uh, Group 9, if we can all show our appreciation for uh, Group 9, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Al, and to all our, our five student groups this afternoon, you have been amazing. I know it sounds like a cliche, we say it so often, but I never fail to be surprised at how incredible the thinking is when you get groups of people who don't know each other coming together and are really passionate about making a change. And what's really struck me this afternoon is just how incredibly different each of your ideas are but also how very valid and possible to take those forward. And I imagine there will be very warm reception to those well beyond ETAG. So I'm looking forward to next year seeing a lot more cyclists in Edinburgh, sourcing lots of Longustine and seeing the Transport for Edinburgh app working infinitely better. Um, possibly not seeing anything hotels being an Edinburgh resident, but if that passed on to other cities and there, were, there was less waste in hotels that would be incredibly welcome and hopefully I have name checked all of you but really I, I can't say strongly enough this is the beginning of an innovation process for you so if you're able to take that forward um, there's plenty of support available to help you do that and, and the fact you've now got four six eight new student peers to, to work with that should make that um, even easier and it looks like we might actually have Kim back. Kim do you want to to pop in and with any questions or comments? Yeah I'm hoping that you can hear me now. Can you hear me? We can yes thank you. No. Yes we can hear you Kim. You can't hear us. So sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you. I can, I can, yes. Oh great. Um group nine, I did I did see all of your presentation and I did see I did see the answers to the questions there. I'm really sorry that I couldn't come in. Um I I just I caught um Ruth's comments there. I just wanted to say that ETAC have been completely thrilled with First of all, the amount of interest in this challenge, um, but I can't tell you how delighted I am with the presentations that I've seen today. Um, I didn't, I guess, really know what to expect coming into this, but um, you've, I don't, I, I actually just don't really know what to say. You've um, come up with such great ideas, presented it in such professional ways. Um, the videos have been fantastic. Um, I'm really thrilled with them. I'm gonna um, try and uh, maybe give some written comments to you because we had a bit of trouble there with the the tech there but um it's been absolutely fantastic i really really appreciate you all taking 
particularly time out of the last four weeks where things have probably been tricky for everyone. Um, and I hope that this present that this kind of project work has been um, fulfilling for you and that you've enjoyed doing it. Um, and just to thank you again for the results that you've come up with. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much, Kim, for uh, um, persevering and coming back at the end as well to give the uh, to give the closing comments there. Um, absolutely. I will finish today by saying thank you to all of you for joining today. Um, and putting so much work in over the last few weeks. I hope that you are able um, uh, to reflect on your experience as a change agent, um, whether or not that is through your Slick or through the Edinburgh Award, or even if it's an opportunity to catch up and debrief with your team um, uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, when the dust has settled. Because we really believe in this program um, and um, we're so thankful for you for putting so much energy into it. As I've said, um, link up with this on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, if you are a change agent that's been part of us, um, uh, then reference students as change agents on your profile as well. You can do that. Um, and as Ruth has already suggested in the conversations, this could just be the start of what happens with your idea. Uh, the university has got um, opportunities through Edinburgh Innovations um, in terms of how uh, you can take ideas forward. So I, I would definitely encourage you to um, explore some of those as well. And so uh, finally, um, just, just a heartfelt thank you to everyone and uh, goodbye, stay safe and take care. Thank you very much, everyone.